most remarkable event took place on this planet just over 70 years ago. And in a couple of months, a particular nation will be celebrating their existence for the second time round amongst the nations of this earth. And I wonder if uh, you know what I'm talking about. Many of you will, of course, and, and many will in, in this room will have witnessed what we term the re-establishment of the state of Israel among the nations of this earth. And it, and it is so remarkable um, due to the fact that 2,000 years prior to that, as it was known, Palestine was pretty much a, a desert wilderness uh, where not much, there, there were some people uh, there, but not much happened. So this afternoon, we're going to look at this little country, um, a little bit about its history, a little bit about the issues which it still faces as a country, and where things are going. And we look at this with Bible in hand. Because whilst we're not politically motivated as Christadelphians with the nation of Israel, they are nevertheless a special people in God's purpose. And that's our interest, that's our standpoint. Because the Bible does talk about the Jews and the country uh, many times and God still has got a special purpose. So in as much as God is interested in Israel, we as Bible readers are interested in it. And I know over the next few weeks uh, you'll be looking at the Middle East and uh, some of these issues particularly concerning Israel. So let's, let's begin. There we are, right at the, uh, the centre of the world really, where three continents join. This tiny little country, uh, Israel. And yet, it is so often in the news, isn't it? In fact, yesterday an F-16 was uh, shot down by Syrian fire and the F-16 landed in northern Israel, crashed, um, caught fire uh, and was incinerated uh, and the two Israeli jet pilots escaped, um, one with serious injuries who is now in hospital. That's because Syria had sent a drone over into Israel. So what, what's going on here? Can we make head or tail? Why are the Palestinians still sending missiles into Israel. Why is Syria sending drones um, with uh, dubious motives into Israel? Why are Israel sending their jets over to bomb uh, Iranian outposts in Syria? What's, what's it all about? So we just want to think about a little bit behind the scenes what's happening. Just in terms of scale, have a look at this. See, Israel's not very big at all, is it? And if you take the West Bank out of it as well, look how tiny it is. So if I drove from here down to London, that's pretty much the whole length of, uh, of Israel. We think Great Britain on a world scale isn't, great, isn't particularly big, but Israel is tiny. It's the, the land uh, mass, the area, is equivalent, it's reckoned approximately, to Wales. So such a tiny country, and yet so much happening and such a big significance on the world stage. Why, is my question. Is it just chance? Is it just one of those things? Or is there something more behind the very fact, as I stated at the outset, that Israel remarkably exists today? Well... This is what happened um, 70 years ago that I spoke of earlier. Here is uh, the declaration of the State of Israel. Can you actually read that, hopefully, just perhaps at the back? Or is it struggling? I think you're struggling a little bit, perhaps. Placing our trust in the rock of Israel, we offer our, or we affix our signatures to this proclamation at this session of the Provisional Council. Thank you for that. Of State of the Soil of the Homeland in the city of Tel Aviv on this Sabbath Eve, the fifth day of IR 5708, the 14th of May, 1948. So that's the declaration David Ben-Gurion, um, who was then uh, 
the president. So there's David Ben-Gurion, and that's a picture of Herzl, um, who had his vision of the state of Israel um, when uh, Jews were being expelled from the pogroms of Russia and, and such like many years earlier. And these are the actual uh, signatures headed up by David Ben-Gurion just there. So it's remarkable. A nation is re-established, a nation that hasn't been there for 2,000 years prior. So, and, and this is what we want to discuss this afternoon. There's an anomaly, there's a paradox here. Because there was great rejoicing amongst many, particularly the Jews, obviously. But there was great consternation and upset amongst the nations around. Why should that be? In fact, the day after the state of Israel was declared, seven nations declared war on Israel, this baby nation. What's going on? Why would ever you want to do that? To a nation that's been, whose people have been persecuted for 2,000 years, why would you want to try and eradicate them? You see, there's something more going on here, isn't there? So their troubles and the, and the hatred between um, Israel and surrounding nations, for some reason, still exists. So there we are, there's the newspapers, the Palestine <laughs> Post, as it was called then. The State of Israel is born, um, the Haaretz uh, paper, uh, and so on and so forth. And there's David, a uh, picture of David Ben-Gurion, so it was all over the press, and um, perhaps some of you have got cuttings of this at home. But you see, Let's just think about our modern world just for a few moments and then we'll go back a little bit in history to try and unravel why we see the modern world as it is. Because if there's one thing we've been learning on, in, in our newspapers, on the news broadcasts, on television or whatever over recent weeks, months, years, is that Israel aren't the only, or the Jews aren't the only group of people that lay claim to the land on which they exist. So you may remember this. Abbas taking to the UN, here he is speaking in the UN a few years ago, uh, making a claim to the land of Palestine. Not for a Jewish state, for, for, but for a Palestinian state. And so we have conversations and debates about the two-state solution. Uh, and so on and so forth. But if actually you look carefully at uh, the Palestinian Manifesto, it doesn't have two states on it. It has one. So there's an issue here, isn't there? Uh, both groups claiming this land. It's ironic, I suppose, that it's happened just since the re-establishment of the State of Israel, because no one wanted it particularly before then. Now it seems everyone wants a part of it. So Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas uh, made the bid for the United, uh, to the, for the United Nations to recognise an independent state of Palestine. But uh, you may, I don't know if, if you watch UN speeches, probably, probably not. <laughs> um, but you might have picked up bits and pieces perhaps captured on the news, you know, the highlights of UN speeches if there is such a thing. Well, I, I took the time and trouble to actually look at what uh, Benjamin Netanyahu uh, had to say in the last two years. And these are just uh, a couple of clips. Um, and we could spend an awful lot of time on this. I'm not going to. But I, all I want to just point out is some of the issues that Netanyahu had to raise at the UN to the UN nations. UNESCO just denied the 4,000 year connection between Israel and the Temple Mount. Why would they do that? Why would they want to deny such a clear connection between the Jewish people and Israel? You know, what motive would drive someone to say, no, don't believe there's any connection at all between the Temple Mount and the Jewish people. Like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's like saying, uh, don't, 
you don't believe in any connection between London you know, and, and the English people, uh, apart from, of course, Jerusalem was there a long time before uh, London, which Weizmann pointed out, didn't he, to Lord Balfour, um, a la the Balfour Declaration. So, but why would, why would someone want to do that? And the second paragraph, there were 20, and this, these, this is a quote from Netanyahu, and he's, he's pointing out to the UN, there's something wrong here. Why are you continually criticising Israel? You know, I'm, and, and I'm not standing here, incidentally, friends, saying that they're perfect or not at all. Okay? But we're just trying to try to get some rationale behind what's going on in the Middle East. So this is what he says. There were 20 UN resolutions against the democratic state of Israel, the only democratic state in that area, and three resolutions against all the other countries on the planet. So what's going on there? Again, I'm just, I'm just presenting it to you as facts and asking the question, why? So the UN decided to make 20 UN resolutions against the state of Israel, criticising them for various, a range of things, for their attitude towards the nations around, and three against all of the other nations put together. Now that seems, whichever way you look at that, that seems out of balance. And Netanyahu goes on to explain, hang on, while Syria are bombing their own people, we are taking some of those refugees and casualties into our hospitals to try and make them better. And yet we get the criticism. What's that? You know, you can listen to the speech yourself. So he's trying to make sense of it. What's, what's going on? Why? Why should that be the case? And the final paragraph he addresses the Secretary General. Mr. Secretary General, I very much appreciate your statement that denying Israel's right to exist is anti Semitism, so it seems as though there's been some movement there. Pure and simple. Now, that's important because for too long, the epicenter of global anti Semitism, this is quite focused, isn't it? Has been right here at the UN. Why is it that the UN, the countries represented at the UN, are so critical, we could even use the word, hateful, of Israel? You see, we might struggle to understand why that should be. Let's go a little bit back in history now. So that's, that's events, and, and, and these clips are taken pretty much apart from the UN speeches um, fr from very recently in the last few months. Um, don't know if you know what happened on the 27th of January this year. Does anyone know what happened on the 27th of January? What was, I hesitate to use the, use the word uh, celebrated, but it was uh, a date of memorial actually. It was the Holocaust. The Jews were remembering the end of the Holocaust when Auschwitz um, was uh, captured, as it were, by Allied troops. Holocaust Memorial Day 2018 special events will take place across the UK and the world to remember the Jews killed. So we look back a little bit further into history of the Jews. They seem to have been singled out, don't they, for hatred. So six million Jews were killed in the Holocaust and they still um, re remember this day. Interestingly, Saudi Arabia now accepts the memorial of the Holocaust Day, the 27th of January, which is remarkable. They would never have done that 30 years ago. So some countries are beginning to understand uh, Israel's position. We could ask a further question then, as the papers have, Haaretz, why did Hitler hate the Jews? You see, it nearly seems irrational, doesn't it? When we look through history, time and time and time again, we see the Jews at the other end of nations and people's hatred for some reason, and it's still persisting. You know, the peace process has been a struggle, hasn't it? A very slow and painful process where no one wants to give an inch 
and it's been going on certainly um, all of my lifetime. And we can look down further in history, you know, the various wars. I'm not going to read them out to you. You can just get a glance of the, of the sort of wars. And we, we could add, that's certainly not exhaustive, we could add to those conflicts. What is it? Why is, it, well, is Israel at the centre of this in the Middle East? The only democratic country. And so, correspondingly, there's been a lot of peace accords and peace attempts. You know, you look back through the American presidents, uh, and they've all wanted to get on, you know, to be seen to be helping the Middle East, don't they? We'll come to Trump in a minute. So, all these uh, different summits and accords, and the road map, probably, we recall. Um, peace of Jerusalem. And so, uh, more recently, <coughs> why moving the US Embassy to Jerusalem is so controversial. And so, it's not something new, incidentally, that uh, Trump has, has said. In, in fact, the President's, was it 94, I think it was signed, by... Um, the US president that yeah Jerusalem should be the capital it's just that they've signed the waiver every six months since then you know Clinton, Obama uh, but Trump is the president that said no I'll sign it this time which he did and the next time I'm not going to sign it because we're going to open our embassy in Jerusalem and acknowledge Jerusalem as the capital and of course the shockwaves from that um, has caused a lot of consternation again What's the problem, we could ask? Why? What's the issue? Why shouldn't Jerusalem be the capital from Israel's perspective? And of course, Netanyahu is very happy um, that uh, Trump has declared that Jerusalem should be the capital. And, and this is where I want to introduce a Bible reference. Can you just turn with me, if you've got your Bibles handy? I have got the reference up there, but I always think it's a good thing if, if, um, if you're able just to turn up the references. I've got some other references on the screen later for you. Um, but if you haven't got your Bible, obviously, um, just, just read it from the screen. So we're looking at um, Zechariah chapter 12. Because the answer, friends, for a lot of... And I have been asking a lot of questions. <laughs> but the answer... And the only answer is in the Bible. That's why we as Christadelphians have such an interest in what's going on in the Middle East. Because there are reasons why Israel are hated by their neighbours. But there are also answers of where it's going to lead. Just look at uh, Zechariah 12. Uh, verse 2, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about, when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people, all that burden themselves with it, shall be cut in pieces, so all people of the earth be gathered together against it. We could nearly say the UN there, couldn't we? United Nations. Though all nations on the earth criticise Jerusalem and make 20... You know, criticisms of UN resolutions against what Israel and Jerusalem represent. Nevertheless, God has still got a purpose. So he's saying here, Jerusalem will be a burdensome stone. It's going to cause trouble. And that's exactly what we're seeing. Isn't, it? Isn't that remarkable? See, Jerusalem has been uh, pictured at the centre of the world for many... This is an ancient map now, but uh, Jerusalem was has for many, many centuries been seen as the, the very central capital of the three continents there. It's not a very good picture. It's a particular mosaic um, put together by a German back in the 15, 1600s. Macron urges France to rise up against anti-Semitic attacks. So it's still happening, even in France, modern-day France. Uh, and, and this was this year, this publication. So again, we say, what's going on? Why are these things happening? Where did it all start? And for that, we need to turn to our Bibles. Can you come with me, please, um, to 
the book of Genesis and chapter 13. We, we need to do just a brief review, and it will have to be fairly brief. But nevertheless, we need to look at what God has said is happening with Israel, where it all started and where it's going. The only place we can turn to for answers is the Bible. So we're going to spend the short time we've got this afternoon looking at some of this. Verse 15, please. Now, Abraham is the acknowledged father of the Jews and of the Arabs, actually. So they both uh, trace their descendants back to Abraham. Now, God made some special promises to Abraham. They start in chapter 12. We're going to pick it up in chapter 13. Some very special promises to Abraham concerning the land. And in fact, Netanyahu refers uh, to these promises in his UN speech, if, if you want to uh, look at it for yourself. Verse 15 and 16. For all the land which thou seest, he says uh, to Abraham, uh, to thee will I give it, note, and to thy seed forever. Now seed is one of those interesting words, both in the English and in the Hebrew, that has both a singular and plural sense to it. A bit like sheep. Uh, and that's intentional. Because Abraham was going to have a seed in terms of many descendants. In fact, goes, God goes on to say in another place in scripture that your descendants will be like the stars of the heaven. If you can count them, or like the sand on the seashore, if you can count them. So he's, he's saying to Abraham, your seed is going to be so many, Abraham, you won't be able to number them. But also, interestingly... The Apostle Paul in the New Testament, we're not going to turn there for this talk, probably come up in, in one of your subsequent talks, uh, but interestingly, the Apostle Paul draws on this and said, yes, that's true, but out of Abraham's descendants, there would be one very special seed as well, singular, and his name is Jesus Christ, who God sent into this world, ultimately, to become king in Jerusalem. So it's all tied up remarkably well. That's in Galatians chapter 3 if you want to follow it up. So here, God says to Abraham, I'm going to give you this land. And in fact, just read on. I'll make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the le length and, uh, of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. So he's, he left Abraham with a challenge. Go on, kick the dust up of, of, of the, this, this country, Abraham. It's going to be yours. Now, Abraham died. And as the Bible presents it, he's now sleeping in the cave of Machpelah, which is just south of Hebron, awaiting God to wake him up when Jesus returns to receive that promised land. Abraham never received, not so much to set a foot on, Stephen says in his New Testament speech. But he will one day, when God wakes him up. It's called the resurrection. In the day of resurrection, Abraham will stand again and will receive that promised land. So it was promised to Abraham. Um, and it goes on, I won't ask you to turn to Genesis 22, but in thy seed shall note all the nations of the earth be blessed if only they would accept God and accept Jesus because thou hast obeyed my voice so the, the promise is extended to Abraham that all nations can be blessed because of these promises but there are conditions attached the trouble is most people and most nations don't want to know God's purpose with this earth at the present time which is very sad so, let's get back to our core topic. Where's the hatred then? Okay, you tell me Abraham was given some promises. Yeah, I get that. Well, what happened next? Well, Genesis chapter 25. Can you turn over to chapter 25, please? See, Abraham's immediate seed was Isaac. And that was a miracle, because Abraham and Sarah were beyond childbearing age, but God allowed them to have a child called Isaac. 
Isaac was a young boy grow and, and, and grew up and also he had a brother Ishmael okay now I'd like to pick up the record uh, in Genesis chapter 25 and we'll look at verse 20 please so Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife the daughter of Bethuel the Syrian of Padan Aram the sister to Laban the Syrian and Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren and the Lord was entreated of him and Rebekah his wife conceived she had a baby and the children struggled together within her so she had twins and they were struggling in her womb and she said if it be so why am I thus and she went to inquire of the Lord so this, this young woman now who was having um, twins wondered what was happening. Verse 23, and the Lord said unto her, and note these words carefully please, two nations are in thy womb, two manna, and that word manna means way, way of living, way of doing things. We could nearly call them perhaps customs and approaches to things. Two manna of people shall be separated from thy bowels and the one people shall be stronger than the other people and the elder shall serve the younger so here Rebecca gets an answer because there's two nations these two babies are going to become as it were two nations and they will be struggling there will be this antagonism this not seeing eye to eye and this friends is where it started and we are still seeing the outworking of this struggling and, 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 and indeed in some cases hatred as in our title so it's uh, a, sta a sad fact of history but the Jewish line comes through Jacob the Israeli line comes through Jacob Jacob had 12 sons and they became known as the tribes of Israel starting with Reuben and ending in Benjamin and they became the epitome of what Israel stood for throughout the rest of the Bible so the promises that God gave to Abraham extended through Isaac and then through Jacob. And you might think I'm laboring this point, but it's very important. Just turn with me to chapter 28 of Genesis. Because this is where the ideologies are completely become topsy-turvy with the Arabs and the Jews. Because both say that Abraham is, is their father and both say actually the promises were to us. We, we inherit the land. The land is ours. That was promised originally to Abraham. So look at Genesis chapter 28. Um, this is on occasion when um, Jacob uh, dreamed a dream. And God revealed his purpose, his continuing and consistent purpose to Jacob. Verse 13. And behold, the Lord stood above it, that's the ladder, as it were, this, this way, and said, I am stood above it, and said, sorry, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac. So we've seen those two. The land whereon thou liest, note, to thee. We're like it. So there's no ambiguity here. This is Jacob. To you, Jacob, will I give this land. And to thy seed, initially the twelve tribes of Israel and then beyond. So there's no ambiguity as to who the land belongs to in terms of what the Bible says. And thy seed shall as be as the dust, and this is a repeat of Abraham, isn't it? The promise to Abraham. Shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, to the south. And in thee and in thy seed, note again, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Well, we can see a consistency then. And, and interestingly, uh, again, Netanyahu mentions this, that uh, 
all of these characters, not all of them, but most of them, are in fact buried in the cave of Machpelah, starting with Sarah, Abraham's wife. So the land was promised to Jacob and his descendants. There we are. Come over to our introductory reading then, please. So God then decided to choose in his wisdom, and as the creator of the universe, I think it's his prerogative who he chooses, he chose Israel to be a witness in the earth of his relationship with a nation. And he chose Israel. And that's what we read in our introductory reading. Verse 6, please, of uh, Deuteronomy 7. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. So we're starting to learn of the uniqueness of Israel amongst the nations now. The creator of this planet has chosen Israel. Verse 7. The Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number than any people for you were the fewest but because the Lord loved you and because he would note keep the oath the promise which he had sworn unto your fathers Abraham, Isaac, Jacob etc and the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh king of Egypt know therefore that the Lord thy God he is God the faithful God which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep note this keep his commandments to a thousand generations so what God is doing here is saying look Israel I've chosen you you're going to be a beacon to the nations if the nations around see what a wonderful relationship it is between God almighty God and a nation and how a nation can prosper under the rulership of God all the nations surely will want to be a part of that but but Israel you have to do it my way you have to obey my laws and my commandments or else the whole the whole beacon the whole example the whole witness falls over it must be done my way he says to Israel so we've just read Deuteronomy 7 there Um, I'm not going to ask you to turn this one up but just to make the point that elsewhere in Deuteronomy, God now has a special purpose with Israel and the people on it. Okay? And he didn't choose them, as we've just read, because they were better or bigger or faster or whatever. He just chose them so that he could work with this country. But it did come with conditions. If you obey me, God says you'll be blessed and all the nations will see how wonderful it works if you live your lives according to the principles of God you will prosper in every sense but and there's a big but if you disobey and you can read all about this in Deuteronomy chapter 28 or Leviticus 26 take your pick they're very similar but from verse 15 onwards of Deuteronomy 28 we have all the curses right through to verse 65 or is it there or thereabouts sadly sadly Israel disobeyed God after all the privileges that they were given and as a result of that they were scattered abroad you see God so much wanted them to be a witness to his love, to his goodness, to the prosperity that God could give them. So Isaiah, the great prophet in the Old Testament, says, you're my witnesses in the earth, Israel. My witnesses. And my servant whom I have chosen. But sadly, they decided to go their own way, worship their own gods, do their own thing in modern language so the curses that are there listed and we can read them ourselves outside of this particular uh, time in chapter 28 
and some of the fundamental curses that come, would come on Israel were that they would be scattered and nations don't like that above all things to be scattered and dispersed throughout all the, the rest of the nations of the earth but look at this so my question to you is did that happen or didn't it did didn't it you know you can google it history of Israel what happened to them if you've got a good encyclopedia at home that'll tell you exactly what happened you know we, th th this isn't rocket science any one of us can test what happened to Israel here God says okay you want to play it that way you don't want to obey me right the curses will come on you scatter you from all peoples from one end of the earth you, you know he's just been saying that I'll give you this land from one part the top to the bottom the left right north south east and west now you're going to be scattered through all the nations and from those nations you will find no rest you see the hatred will be there no rest because you've disobeyed me. They shall fall by the edge of the sword. Hatred. Be led away captive to all nations. Hatred. Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles. Be subservient to other ruling powers. And that's been the case, hasn't it? Babylon, Rome, Turkey. It's only since 1967, interestingly, but that will be another topic. We can't look at that tonight. Uh, this afternoon, sorry. Um, that, that it's been back in their own hands so isn't it remarkable and, and here's something else to reflect on uh, Deuteronomy 28 there verse 37 your name will become a proverb, a byword people will use your, your name as a term of opprobrium derogatory you Jew and we hear it yeah it's part of the curse. So we have the wandering Jew. That's uh, the Roman coin declaring Judea captor. When uh, the Jews were made captive, here's one of the iconic pictures you've probably seen in a newspaper or magazine of the arrest and deportation of many Jews into pogroms initially and then across onward to the camps where the children and women were largely just told to go one way and exterminated and any useful people to do any, any jobs were kept and the six million Moes who were humiliated by having to wear a star a yellow star to single themselves out for hate amongst others how terrible man can be to man and yet it's part of the history of the Jews now you might know Mark Twain from some of the novels that you read over the years from children upwards but something else he wrote was this you see he was an outsider looking in, he was an, an American author, he, knew, he was the, an outsider looking and said after all this how do they still exist? after all the hatred, after all the apparent extermination, after all the wars, how do they still exist? All things are mortal but the Jew, it seems, he's saying. All other forces pass, but he remains. It's like a question mark in, in his mind. How does this work? What is the secret of his immortality? If the statistics are right, the Jews constitute 1% of the human race, properly the Jew ought hardly to be heard of, but it's quite the converse, isn't it? We're always hearing of the Jew. You might think of other nations on the earth that are similar size. We never hear about them. Well, there's an answer. Come to Jeremiah 30, please. And the Bible answers it. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 11. So God says through his prophet to Israel, through Jeremiah, For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee, though I make note a full end of all nations whither I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee, but I will correct thee in measure, and I will not leave thee altogether unpunished. So God has got a plan with Israel. They were to suffer, but they weren't to be obliterated. 
That's the answer to Mark Twain's question. So the survival of the Jews. There we are, we've just read that. So what we see is the Bible goes on to say, yes, they will be punished and they will be hated amongst the nations, but you know what? I've got a plan that goes beyond that and it brings them back. And so we can look at maps of where the Jews from the 1800s have been returning in large number through ships like the Exodus, people bringing all their belongings, their whole life's possessions, that is, in that case there, in that big, uh, in that box, that's, that's their, their whole possessions in their lives coming to a new land where they knew no one, knew nothing, um, but they're just going back what they called home, back to their homeland. It's, it's, it is unique. In the world's history, it is unique. It hasn't happened to any other, other nation. And here are some of the scriptures which underscore. I'm not going to ask you to turn them up. I just had a glance at the clock and time is ticking by. Um, but isn't it remarkable again that God says, yes, I will scatter you. But I'm going to bring you back again. And your land, rather than being a wasteland, will be sown once again. You will grow fruit once again in your land. You will build cities once again in your land. And that's what we've been seeing over the last 40, 50, 60, 70 years. You see, what other book, friends, what other book could have prophesied that thousands of years ago? In detail. There isn't another book. That's why we can put our trust in the Bible. You shall be tilled and sown. And this is uh, one commentator who wrote a book in the 1800s saw that this needed to happen. And said the pre-eventual colonisation of Palestine, the settlement of the land before the return of Christ, that is, will be on purely political principles. And that's what we've seen. And the Jewish colonists will return in unbelief of the Messiahship of Jesus. That's true. That's exactly what's happened. That's remarkable. And that was written a hundred years before the state of Israel. From the Bible. From just reading the Bible carefully. So a couple of moments on what's going to happen in the future then. Because if we can put our trust in and see that... And we could spend a lot longer on this, but... Um, in such detail, things have come true regarding Israel. And we could go on and on and on and on. Uh, and so uh, do stay with this, uh, this new series for the coming weeks, and I'm sure a lot more will come out of it. But what's, what's, what's going to happen? Is, is that it for Israel? Are everyone going to sort of say, well, okay, we'll be your friends now? The hatred's over. Well, I think we can see from our early slides, the UN anti-Semitism and such like, no it's not the end yet, and that's true future prophecies concerning Israel see Ezekiel chapter 38 says that another confederacy of nations will come against Israel from the north and attack Israel now, so it will be an overwhelming attack an attack that the F-16s that we talked about earlier of Israel will not be able to repel and overcome. It will be like a cloud that comes down over Israel. We believe prophetically when we look carefully at the Bible in Ezekiel 38 that will be headed by a Russian group together with other countries such as Iran. Now again I'm sure that will be dealt with in, in more detail. But here are some of the place names that are mentioned in that prophecy. Magog up here, Persia, Libya, Egypt, um, and here's Israel in the centre. And we just do find it interesting about uh, who's amassing a lot of airfields and troops in Syria, just north to Israel at the moment, with the Russians um, putting down a lot of bases there. So we look at what's happening, um, and we know that there will be another battle, Armageddon, in Israel, centred in Israel. But the good news is this. 
that at this time when Israel finally can see no way out when they are pretty much completely destroyed where there will be refugees running out of Israel wherever they can where there will be chaos and tumult and upset and warfare centred in Israel when Israel will be on their knees that God will reveal his hand again to the nations of the earth through his son the Lord Jesus Christ come with me to our final reference please in Zechariah Zechariah 14 this time So we look at what's happening and try to see in the light of the Bible how what is unfolding is in fact exactly what we see to be God's purpose in the Bible. You see verse 1 of Zechariah chapter 14. Behold the days of the Lord cometh and thy spoil shall be divided against the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem, God says, to battle. So the hatred hasn't finished yet. And the city shall be taken. That's Jerusalem, you see. This burdensome stone. It will be taken. The houses rifled, the women ravished. Half of the city shall go forth into captivity. And the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then. Verse 3. It's a big word. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle and his feet, we believe that's referring to Jesus Christ shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives which is before Jerusalem on the east and the Mount of Olives shall recleave in the midst thereof toward the east, toward the west shall be a very great valley and half of the mountains shall remove toward the north and half toward the south and so then, verse 9 and the Lord shall be king over all the earth in that day shall there be one Lord and his name one so friends there's a picture of the Mount of Olives um, and interestingly there is an earthquake fault that runs right through the Mount of Olives which we expect to be active um, and indeed split that mount at the time of the return of Jesus Christ which we believe is very soon And so Jesus Christ will return in amongst the tumult and the warfare that's going on in the Middle East. And he will deal with the nations. But he promises that he will bring a time of righteousness and peace. And what a wonderful thing. And I want us just to, to, to close on this thought really. That we've thought a lot about the warfare and the hatred and and such like but actually there is hope through all of this when Jesus Christ returns that he will bring true righteousness and a lasting peace in the Middle East you see all these you know, accords and, and road maps and peace processes have fallen by the way haven't they the one that Jesus Christ brings will last forever friends and we can be a part of that so my plea to you is to read the Bible for yourselves. Hear more over the forthcoming weeks of what's happening and how God, through his word, the Bible, makes sense of what's happening in the Middle East. So a very brief summary then. Remarkably, Israel as a nation exists. They're still singled out for criticism. Bible tells us why. We've seen some of that. Israel fulfills Bible prophecy time, 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 time again. Remarkably so. There is going to be a final war in Israel and the nations will be overcome finally, not by Israel by Jesus Christ. And God's eternal kingdom will be established. Have no doubt about that. God's work purpose will be fulfilled. And the wonderful note that we can leave on is that in his days, the days of Jesus Christ, shall the righteous flourish, an abundance, an abundance, isn't that a lovely word? 
of peace so long as the moon endures. Thank you.